We have spent hours talking to customers, trawling community forums, and testing open source applications to come up with what we believe is the ultimate managed service provider tech stack. We've got everything in here you need for your customers and for your own internal infrastructure, from things like VoIP solutions, to backup, to remote management, marketing automation tools, and much, much more. Not only that, but we've brought in two absolute authorities in the space. We've got Tom Lawrence, MSP and content creator with 47 million YouTube views, and Jay LaCroix, technologist and head of Learn Linux TV, to help us write it. So if you're not happy with the vendors you're using at the moment, perhaps you'd like something that develops faster, offers a better standard of support, you owe it to yourself to go and see what's out there in the world of open source. Grab your copy now, the link's below, and no email address is required. Right. Hello and welcome to our quick fire session. Today we're going to aim to give you a taste of the opportunities out there for your customers and your business when you look beyond the big three cloud providers that you're all familiar with, AWS, GCP, and Azure. So we often talk about the idea behind cloud choice, but in this session we'll dive into a technical example of how it looks to build on open source. And we're on LinkedIn Live and YouTube Live, so with any luck, I should be able to see your questions coming in from both platforms here. But let us know in the chat, please, where are you tuning in from and which cloud providers do you currently use? So to kick things off, my name is Joe. I'm currently based out of Vermont, and I work on the partner enablement team here at Akamai, also accompanied by Pat, who I will let introduce himself. Hey, I'm Pat. Um, I'm a senior solutions engineer here at Akamai, based out of Minnesota. And uh, I'm here to talk about the technical aspects of cloud choice today. So I'll kick it back to you, Joe. Great. Yeah. And just a quick overview of what we'll be discussing here today. So we're going to start with an intro of who Akamai is, followed by why cloud choice is important. We'll give some examples of modernization. We'll introduce Nomad, share some more examples and tools for you. And make sure to stick around until the end because you'll find a free gift after our presentation here. So kicking things off, I really want to highlight what is Akamai Cloud and why does it matter? So to understand what Akamai Cloud is, you should understand the, the cloud components. So this diagram is going to show you the three recognized cloud models. So you have the SaaS layer, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, software as a service. This is specific user-focused applications. Normally, it'll be accessible via a web browser. Some examples might be Microsoft Teams, Salesforce, Dropbox, and so on. Then the middle layer is going to be the platform as a service. So this is the underlying technology stack that's going to enable you to run those software applications. Sometimes it's referred to as middleware, but these might be a web server, development container, database, and so on. Then you have us. And we fall into the infrastructure as service. We're the building blocks the supplying foundation. So this is the compute, the storage, the networking infrastructure. So when you use a Linode, which is our term for a virtual machine or a VM, we're enabling you to deploy your choice of Linux distribution. And whether that's Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, what we do is we take responsibility for making sure the infrastructure and network is performing. And then the applications, whatever you run on top of that, that'll be your responsibility. And when we talk about infrastructure as a service, this is really what we mean. So we're talking about compute or other services such as S3 compatible storage, managed databases or Kubernetes. And as you can see, for those of you who are already familiar with AWS as services, Akamai is gonna be something very similar to their core primitives. Though we do have a bit of a different model. So in, this here, you'll see that the three, three big hyperscalers, you'll get more of a monolithic data center architecture versus at Akamai, where you're going to find a distributed data center architecture. And with one of the biggest differentiators of our architecture is that we sit on Akamai's backbone network. So you'll find we have about 16 data center launches that are coming this year alone. Three have already happened. You can expect state of the art, brand new equipment at all of those. And you're not going to be compromising or spending an arm and a leg compromising price. So you'll have the advantage of decreasing your prices and increasing your cloud margins. So most importantly, without compromising performance, 
we have the best price to performance in the industry to date. And it's super duper easy to use us. <laughs> With this visual, what we're trying to show is how intuitive the platform really is. So you don't have to pay to get your technician certified. You're choosing your distribution. You're selecting your region. You're picking the instance type and running it up, spinning it up. And we know how expensive development resources are. And the main point here is whether you're using this interface that you see, the CLI or the API, you're going to be spending less time on administrative tasks and leaving more time for development and building applications, which also means more time for selling. <laughs> so if you've ever quoted one of the big three, you've likely found it's anything but straightforward. So in some cases, you might even end up taking a hit because you're not quite sure of how you should be pricing this out. So our pricing is super simple. We do offer a calculator. It is not required. So you're going to have predictable bills. You'll not only know, but also be able to define your own margins as well. And then there are no hidden costs or fees behind that. So as a partner, you get access to free 24-7 phone support. This is just out of the box part of our program. So before I hand it over to Pat in a second here, I did want to share some examples of our open source tools that are available in our marketplace today. So our marketplace is going to offer a way for you to do one-click deployments. It's going to keep it super simple and quick to spin up your applications. And yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Pat to kick things off. Awesome, thanks Joe. All right, so we're gonna dive into cloud choice a bit here. Um, and James, if you wanna queue up the next slide, thank you. Uh, the title of this webinar, uh, use the words cloud choice, right? So all organizations making choices on which technologies or clouds that they'll use and why for that matter, have to start with a strategy alignment. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to talk about some what are, what are called uh, modernization initiatives. Technology systems, unfortunately, have a limited lifespan, and at some point, modernization needs to come into the picture. However, how you choose to modernize and whether you're going to work um, move your workloads to the cloud or not, um, they need to be aligned closely with strategy. So starting on the right-hand side here in blue, organizational leadership firstly wants to know, are we doing the right thing? Modernization projects typically implement improved data processing and reporting techniques and help companies unlock valuable data and insights to help them understand if they're even building the right things or making the right decisions. So then it comes down to, are we doing the thing right? Modernization projects also um, will focus on implementing automation tooling and other things to bring operational efficiency forth. Lastly, it's really important that companies are able to pivot or embrace new market opportunities um, very quickly. So modernization um, efforts need to focus on enabling teams uh, to reduce technical debt um, and, and the, the amount of time they're spending on supporting their systems versus building new innovative features. So all of that sounds great, but it also needs to be aligned with your technology. So looking on the left-hand side of the diagram, our technology leadership really needs to, to focus on a few things as well, including consistent delivery cadence. This allows the roadmaps that you're putting together to be more predictable. So if and when your company needs to pivot, they know when um, uh, an initial feature of something is gonna come out so that they can make a, their next decision. Improved security posture uh, helps companies preserve their reputation, comply with regulations, um, and also minimizes risk of downtime or data loss. Finally, Reducing your total cost of ownership is, a, is an extremely important piece considered for modernization initiatives because um, companies need to scale their systems better. They need to um, consolidate their technologies uh, if they've got a scattering of different types. And overall, these initiatives fall into these modernization strategies. So let's dive into how that factors into cloud choice. So. This is kind of funny. Uh, it's something that you're probably familiar with. It's the old adage of build versus buy. Once organizations align that there are applications or systems that need to be modernized, then a whole swath of teams come together to do discovery and do analysis and all these sort of things start happening. And this inevitably comes up. But what we really want to focus on in build versus buy is what I'll call the abilities, such as availability, scalability, maintainability. These are all your day two operations that become important after you launch a new product. These decisions ultimately affect performance, cost, and security as well, which were our strategy concerns we talked about. 
So when we talk about build on the left-hand side, we're talking about building your app on cloud primitives. So compute, storage, networking. Um, as companies contemplate whether they should choose build, they look at things like how deep are our customization needs for our application? Um, especially if you're building out differentiated features to be uh, a leading market supplier or gain a competitive advantage, that's a good choice uh, on the build side of things. Um, companies that have specific security and compliance requirements may also choose to build. And uh, another important aspect is portable architectures where you may need to deploy in multi-cloud or hybrid environments. Now, one of the traps or downsides to building is uh, we want to focus on reduce, reducing wasting time and energy on undifferentiated activities. So on the right-hand side, when we talk about buy, we mean using a managed service, uh, such as a managed database, for example, Amazon RDS is an example of a managed database solution. Another example is a lot of app builders um, use a backend as a service such as Google Firebase, and that would be another example. So organizations will often choose to buy when they need to rapidly prototype. They'll use a managed service to build this up, uh, get some feedback from the market, and then may choose to build and customize from there. They may have specialization gaps. Maybe they're uh, launching an emerging practice such as machine learning. An example of that might be AWS SageMaker is a managed service that um, can offer companies a quick way to get started with machine learning if they are lacking specialization or expertise in the company. Um, companies that may want to take advantage of operational excellence, such as high availability, scalability, automated backups, disaster recovery, et cetera, may choose managed services that offer those options. Um, and then lastly, um, as far as integration options go, I mentioned Google Firebase earlier. That's a solution that allows app developers to quickly build up an app. It includes things like authentication, storage, functions as a service, caching, and message queues, for example, all wrapped in one API. So one of the traps or downsides of buy, though, is that often these services have multi-dimensions and completely different dimensions in terms of how to cost them. So budgeting or costing these solutions can be difficult as they scale, often even resulting in ballooning costs. And the other consideration there is it may limit your options and agility as a result uh, due to uh, feature parity or lacking of thereof. So let's look at some specific examples to solidify these concepts. So our first example here is a real basic website modernization example. So when we look at this, we've got an on-premise website here um, that contains the normal three-tier components that you might see. Now, in this example, we're talking about a small company with a small development team, and they want to modernize this. Um, they, they want to move it to the cloud. The website currently exists deployed on-prem, as stated. Uh, they'll eventually overhaul the site, but when you move something to the cloud, you want to limit your re-architecture as a good practice. So the other thing about this is the team that maintains the database today on-prem uh, is not going to be maintaining this database for this new stack in the cloud. So the team that owns the website is currently going to have to consider how they want to maintain this relational database. So as they try to decide whether deploying this uh, in the cloud makes sense and whether they use a managed service or whether they build it and what cloud they should deploy to, let's dive into some of the considerations that, that uh, they need to go through to, to determine that. So some of the questions and concerns that a team has moving forward in this case might be specifically around the database. Let's consider a mature product in this case, such as Amazon RDS, which is a managed database and sort of uh, in this case shown in the right. Um, and as they ponder their choice, they think about things like, given they have limited database experience, should they and can they own deploying and maintaining a database cluster, the backups, the high availability and the scaling scenarios. So the team's confident that they understand the access patterns and they do have load tests to size it initially. So what they do in this case is they'll gather data uh, through these tests, and then they'll ask other questions that help them ultimately decide whether to build versus buy. Questions include, would building this capability out uh, differentiate their product in ways that would be limited otherwise? Would building this out create cost management complexity? Can the cost be modeled and justified versus the alternative of building and managing the database and the operational concerns for it for their website? Are there any other issues to consider, such as portability or compliance concerns? 
Ultimately, the answers to these questions could certainly justify a case where a managed service makes sense from a risk uh, and cost perspective. So the team may ultimately choose a solution such as a managed database in this case. But let's talk about another modernization use case. So as we look at this use case, this is portraying a potential for a large modernization initiative that might span multiple years um, and will have its own unique challenges. So there are many organizations that have grown organically out of on-premise infrastructure originally to serve local needs uh, and potentially had grown to serve external needs, such as adding websites and e-commerce. For example, organizations in manufacturing, retail, and agriculture, just to name a few, often have legacy applications in one or many on-prem locations that are good candidates for modernization. And overall, there may be some applications that are more ready than others, as well as systems that may stay deployed on-prem and not be moved to the cloud anytime soon. For example, an enterprise ERP that's tightly coupled to uh, e-commerce and other applications may not be ready for the foreseeable future. So a scenario shown like the one above with a website, multiple e-commerce sites, a combination of legacy applications and monolithic applications, and a mixed bag of deployment and operation tooling is a common scenario that organizations face. This might be a scenario to look beyond the big three when it comes to a cloud provider and modernizing your strategy. So let's look at a roadmap for that. This is uh, also a common and fun picture, uh, kind of like the build versus buy earlier, but it, it does portray well a modernization journey that I wanted to talk about today. So many companies have already taken advantage of moving workloads from bare metal to VMs and have gained the efficiencies and cost um, efficiencies out of that. But for some organizations, the benefit of Kubernetes sound really attractive. I mean, you have more advanced bin packing, you have lighter weight services, and the ability to automate a ton of operational things like fault tolerance, monitoring, and scalability. However, making the leap directly from an environment mostly running on VMs may start to violate best practices around limiting re-architecture and also working towards incremental improvements when overhauling technologies. Therefore, for many organizations, simply containerizing workloads or running them on top of Docker or more basic orchestration tool may be an intermediate path that allows them to take stepping stones towards a more advanced architecture. So let's look at how that might happen. Here's an example of how such a journey might take place. So typically, once you've decided on um, the strategy and an initiative to move forward, IT architects or software development teams might engage in something called a spike or an experimental sprint. And in this case, maybe they want to figure out how can we containerize some of our applications. So let's say you've done this and you now have one of your apps working locally in a container and you've deployed it to Docker Hub even. You might even run some searches online or look for other alternatives to Kubernetes or say lightweight container runtime solutions. So certainly tools like Amazon ECS, which is Elastic Container Service or HashiCorp Nomad, or even others such as Docker Swarm or Apache Mesos are likely to be returned in your search results. In the context of our platform modernization theme, um, today we'd like to dive specifically into AWS ECS and HashiCorp Nomad to consider as an alternative to the big three. So let's take a look at these. All right, so on the screen here, you've got your basic side-by-side -side comparison here. I kind of wanted to dive into the first couple of points. So from an orchestration capability, HashiCorp Normad um, orchestrates containers, VMs, binaries, and shell scripts, whereas ECS focuses strictly on containers. From where can I run these workload standpoint, HashiCorp Nomad can be deployed on Linux, Mac, and Windows hosts, so can be deployed pretty much anywhere. Um, ECS is an AWS-only tool, so it's deployable within AWS's environment. These first two points are kind of a big deal when it comes to the long-term platform modernization strategy we talked about earlier. I guess to say from the points above, Nomad would be allowing you to deploy some workloads in the cloud initially and moving some over time. It also allows you to keep workloads on-prem, maybe for the foreseeable future. So with this hybrid approach seeming feasible, can we achieve the total cost of ownership outcomes, including the technology footprint, consolidation, and a maintainability in a hybrid environment? I mean, having these things, uh, having to deploy this ourselves and host it in two environments may seem complex, but we'll talk about that in a minute. 
But if Nomad were running on on-prem and cloud locations, what are the benefits we could get? Well, we could run our heterogeneous workloads because they support multiple runtimes. For example, we could continue running many of our existing workloads in Nomad on-prem while we work on containerizing workloads that are ready. Using Nomad across the board would also allow us to consolidate our CI CD tooling and pipeline for management of these applications. For example, Terraform could be used to deploy on-prem and in the cloud. Finally, the last aspect to consider is our operational tooling, such as monitoring and observability. Using Nomad in our on-prem and cloud deployments would allow us to standardize our tooling and our deployment methodology. So let's take a look at what it looks like quickly to deploy Nomad itself in our cloud. All right, so in the diagrams beyond this part, we're gonna kind of abstract Nomad away and show more of a workload example, but it's worth it to take a second and look at how Nomad is deployed. So in this diagram, we show a basic production deployment of Nomad in a data center. Uh, it includes console, which is used for service discovery and clustering of the Nomad server. Nomad server is where the scheduled jobs are registered and then allocated to clients. Clients are actually where the workloads are run. So when you're running containers, executables, VMs, or batch jobs, all of those are scheduled through Nomad server and then push, pushed out to clients where they actually run the workloads. So the cool thing about Nomad is that it runs as a single binary and it can be run in server and agent or client mode simultaneously. So one thing you can do uh, as a homework assignment is you can leave this today if you wanna run Nomad, download it, run Nomad, the agent command slash dev, and you'll have an up and running Nomad instance on your local machine that you can start putting workloads on right away. All right, so let's dive into the website modernization architecture example. All right, there's so much we could talk about Nomad architecture. I wanted to just take some time though to drive home the last few slides and look at a starting point for your hybrid cloud deployment using our previous example. We're gonna walk through a potential MVP for this initial moderniz modernization example, and it's gonna be a starting point for how we take our original legacy infrastructure on-prem and deploy it in a hybrid environment. This current diagram is not very interesting right now, but in the next few slides, we'll fill in some of these gaps. So let's move forward. All right, so this is just a quick kind of visual to show you, here's what a Nomad cluster might look like on the on-prem. We filled in some initial white space, but we kind of want to zoom into this so we can dive into the pieces individually a bit more. So let's do it. All right, so, in our on-prem data center, we now have a Nomad cluster. And in this, we've got an example of a couple of things that we talked about earlier. Firstly, on the left side, we've got an example of our CI CD tooling. This leverages GitLab for source control, Jenkins for CI CD orchestration. And in this example, in the Jenkins deployment, we're sort of illustrating a basic three-step build, store, and deploy process. So we, we can build our artifacts, so in this case, we're showing Composer, which is a PHP package manager, and Docker, which is allowing us to build our containers. We can store our artifacts in Artifactory and then use Terraform and Ansible to deploy. On the right-hand side, we've got Nginx, which provides our ingress traffic management. And in this case, it can now be the primary proxy for traffic to our legacy applications, as well as our modern apps and tooling. And on the bottom, we have Prometheus and Grafana. And these will provide a foundation for our observability. So now if we zoom back out on the next slide, we can tee up kind of how this architecture comes together on a hybrid perspective. So now we can see we've got our, on the left, we've got our on-prem kind of set up with our Nomad cluster. So now if we click to the next slide, we can see how it works on our cloud. So here's a visual now of just quickly of what it kind of looks like with Nomad in both areas. We've sort of filled in our white space and our gaps. So now again, we're gonna zoom in to our cloud architecture and touch on that quickly. Our cloud data center on the right hand, uh, or on, on the zoomed in side here now has an example of our migrated website. Again, in this case, we have Nginx as our ingress and we're combining that with, in this example, WordPress and MariaDB to serve our web content. In addition, similarly as before, we have Grafana and Prometheus for our metrics and monitoring. So now if we hit the next slide, we can kind of uh, 
wrap this overall architecture up here. So we wanted to take one last look at this final diagram to really bring home these final points. You'll notice here how the two deployments appear mirrored, and this is intentional. It's, it's meant here to highlight the advantages of this approach, which includes tooling normalization between on-prem and cloud, the capability to deploy apps where it makes the most sense and using the same deployment tooling and methodologies, and the ability to modernize incrementally. So let's finish up by summarizing these tools and that are deployed here and the outcomes achieved. So overall, what we're highlighting here is a potential MVP for your initial modernization roadmap which consists of normalizing your CI CD tool sets that exist in your on-prem Nomad cluster in this case, but they could be run on any of your Nomad environments as you expand your footprint in the future. And it's capable of deploying in a consistent manner, both on-prem and cloud. Moving your original website to the cloud, so our website components now have been standardized. Standardizing your ingress tooling for on-prem and cloud deployments via Nginx in this case and standardizing your initial metrics and monitoring tools for on-prem and cloud deployments being Prometheus and Grafana in this case, which by the way are integrated very well with Nomad for collecting metrics on the Nomad cluster itself. Therefore, since Nomad is able to run on any type of general compute, um, you know this could be a use case that enables organizations to explore their cloud choices beyond the big three. So now I'd like to hand it back to Joe. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pat. And obviously, that was a really quick walkthrough, but I hope it's a useful example. And don't forget, this is what we do. So reach out to Pat or a pre-sales team here at Akamai. If you have a project, we can walk through whether open source can offer benefits for your specific use case. And we're nearly at the end of our session, so let me give you a couple of pointers. And depending on where you fall and how you've been working with Akamai so far, if we go to the next slide, here are some QR codes for your reference. So I always recommend checking out our content. You'll find ebooks, videos, architectural references, you name it. Uh, you can easily compare costs and savings there with our cloud estimator tool. And we are offering a $500 cloud credit for you to test and run this yourselves. Hopefully in the end, it makes sense and everything's up to your satisfaction. And if so, our partner program is completely free to join. So lastly, one last thing here, we always know credits are great, but sometimes we don't know what to do with them. So we wanted to leave you with a few examples of how you can use your cloud credit. Uh, you can see here disaster recovery, pen testing. These are just some really common use cases on the platform. And that wraps it up and brings it to our Q&A. So let's see what we have here. All right, Pat, we have a couple of questions for you if you wanna take those. Okay. Sure. Um, I'll do the first one that's on the screen right now here. It says, how developers interact with Nomad to provision workloads and manage them? Um, so great question. Um, like many tools, Nomad comes with the ability uh, to use a CLI. Uh, their clusterized deployment has a UI available that you can load to see your workloads, and there's an API. Um, but the cool thing is, is again, the CLIs are the, the Nomad is a single binary. So the CLI is run from that single bi binary. It's also worthy to note there are job templates that can be written to sort of define your workloads. And they use what's called HashiCorp uh, configuration language or HCL for short. Um, it uses a declarative syntax similar to YAML, I guess, is the best way to say it. And, but it uses curly braces to sort of encapsulate the parent-child relationship. Um, so these interactive tools combined with HCL allows you to administrate and I guess automate all the things you need to do with Nomad. So hopefully that answers the question. Great. Um, we do have another one here as well. I'll, I'll give a few minutes for this other question. It's I've noticed there are enterprise versions of Nomad that are licensed. Does the architecture you've shown assume open source or enterprise version? Pat, that's for oh, you. that's a very good question. So. Yeah, the architecture shown in this example is is assuming the OSS version of Nomad. Um, the OSS version contains, I mean, a ton of features to, to help you initially grow and scale your solution. Um, Nomad, I guess, like many other open source solutions, have a have a open source and enterprise or or licensed version. I mean, even like Apache Kafka, for example, has has that through Confluent, um, and 
in general, I would say Nomad Enterprise features uh, focus around enterprise scalability. So when you start talking about things like automated upgrades, backups, et cetera, Enterprise includes features for that, although you can roll a lot of the, your own using open source tools. Um, maybe in, uh, other things I've seen are enhanced or more fine-grained policies and namespace configurations are part of Enterprise. But uh, to shorten it up, everything that was shown today is completely deployable with the open source version. Great, thank you. And we do have some other questions, but with a minute left, we do wanna give you the prize that we promised at the end of this presentation. So if we move along to the next slide here, um, you'll see not only the contact information where you can reach out and ask any questions that you do have, anything that we can assist with at partners at linode.com, but you can also claim your $25 Starbucks gift card there. So please connect with us on LinkedIn, reach out to us, let us know what questions you have. We're here to help and be a resource for you. Absolutely. And thanks for joining everyone. Yep. Thank you so much. Are you missing out on business because AWS is too complex and maybe too expensive for some of your customers? Take advantage of Akamai Cloud Computing Services and give your customers a better option for their Linux cloud hosting. With our flat, transparent, easy to quote pricing model, you can save your customers more than 70% on the hosting portion of their projects. Plus, as a partner, you get free zero tier expert technical support 24 seven via phone and email, a simple interface that lets you spin up services in seconds and $500 of free cloud credit when you test us out. Click the link below to claim your credit and learn more about how we can support you in growing the cloud side of your business.